probably the biggest lesson for any creative is like if there's if there's no audience you're still doing it and that's you know that's I think that should be the first aim the first aim yeah, yeah it's, it's just it's just like treasure that mentality and go nuts that was Daniel Craig aka Matsu he is a photographer a director a DOP and an overall creative powerhouse Daniel's journey started as a live event photographer, but today he directs music videos, makes TV spots, tours with some of the biggest artists in the world, well, actually, that was before the pandemic days, and has worked with some of the biggest brands you know in the world, like Toyota and Adidas. He regularly shoots for one of my favorite musicians of all time, Tame Impala, and some of his photos have ended up in Times Square, in New York, and the Rolling Stones magazine. If that wasn't enough, he has his own photo book called Dust, an intimate look into the life of station workers in the West Australian outback. In this episode of The State of the Creators, Daniel and I dive deep into some ideological views about creativity, we talk about what it's like working with global brands and artists, what it takes to succeed in a multidisciplinary creative path, and how his love for martial arts defined his creative journey. A quick plug-in for my YouTube channel, if you're watching it on YouTube, please do like this video. It takes me days to plan, research, prep, and at least a few hours to edit just one of these episodes for the podcast. So a simple like and a subscribe can go a long, long way for me. And I really appreciate for those who support this podcast and my creative work in general. Also, you can follow me on Instagram at Tausifakas and sign up for my fortnightly newsletter where I talk about life as a creative at www.tausifakas.com. All right, without further ado, here is The State of the Creator Season 2, Episode 3, featuring Daniel Craig, aka Matsu. Hope you enjoy the show. This is The State of the Creator show about creative individuals who are on a quest to build something out of nothing. <laughs> like one where it was like they were wearing outfits that had logos all over them like Ferrari and NASA and, and like they originally it was fine but then they wanted to um because NASA's a big thing. Now. Oh yeah, yeah. NASA's. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how. Na- sudden, yeah, NASA. I don't know how NASA went mainstream, but it did. That you got to get one, man. Right now, let's do it. Really? But yeah. What, what? What would it be? It's like, yo, fam, what's up? No, I don't, <laughs> don't do that. Cut it. Cut that. Cut it. No, 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 no. no, I'm gonna keep that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you gotta. You gotta come up with something just for the for the fun of it. No, I think I think what I do is, uh, you know, I think it makes uh, the guests awkward. Like if I do, hey guys, welcome to this, and yeah, then I, just. Just kills the fire. I'm, so, I'm about it, man. Bring it. Bring that intro, dude. <laughs> I, 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 I'm gonna keep that that yo fam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you just um, part of the contract was I could use anything that you produce in this show for contract. Ever. I don't remember signing a contract. But oh, I just feel... by appearing here, you're a part of the contract. Oh so. god, I mean, I, I just yeah. roped you into every, every signing up yeah, your yeah, whole yeah. life away. You're gonna recut this whole thing, so whatever I say is gonna be completely different. But um, I'm, hey. No, it's it, it's gonna be it's gonna be quite quite um, interesting to see afterwards what I what I do with it. So um, yeah, yeah. Be, be ready to get a lawyer if you need. <laughs> get my lawyer. I'll, let me just uh, get my give me my phone back. Let me uh, let me get my lawyer ready. No, no. no. Well, look b- before anything else. Um, why why Matsu or, or Matsu? How 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 do you say it? Why Matsu? So Matsu is a Japanese word. Um, it means pine tree. Um, and it's a tree that I really. I'm attracted to in Japan. It's the kind of like the really cool spindly. You can't see my or maybe you can see my hands yeah. moving, but the really spindly, kind of beautiful pine tree in Japan. Um, and it's got a really strong base in which it sort of branches off. And so I was always attracted to that tree and and the idea of having a strong base, but having many sort of different branching aspects to mm-hmm. whatever I do. Um, and it also happens to be my wife's maiden name. Oh wow! Well, half of my wife's maiden. Okay. So her name is. Matsumura, which means okay. village of the pine trees. Wow. And so I just I took the Matsu um, both because I personally had an interest in it and mm-hmm. it was attached to my to my wife. And, yeah, and I turned it into uh, a name to represent my work because my actual name, which is Daniel Craig, you know, it's 
it sets a high bar that I generally, most of the time, fall well below of. So it was right. nice to. <laughs> I don't know about that. Too sure. Yeah, 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 nice. Man. Keep keep saying stuff like that. I'll be back for uh, episode <laughs> two, but it won't be two, but it will be future two. Future two. Yeah. Uh, it's um. Uh, I, I, so did you get the name after you met your new wife or after yeah after, right, yeah right, it was right. something that, that would have been really right. really cool if you had named name Matsu and then you met, met her and you're like holy crap bro that's some universe talking right I there know. like that's <laughs> hey you're meant to be together so for people who are unfamiliar with your work who is Daniel Craig aka Matsu um I'm a I'm a ph- photographer originally um but now I've moved on to TV directing, um, which has been a lot of fun, as well as I'll, I'll DOP and then I'll direct other creative projects as well. And to, to be honest, going back to that kind of Matsu tree thing, I kind of like I have a few different sort of ways of expressing myself yep. um, visually. Um, so at the moment, my main thing probably is is directing and TV commercial directing, music video directing. Mm. Um but I've, I've I've been able to do some really cool projects with my photography. I've been able to to tour around Australia. I was on a, a tour with Tame Impala, which was a lot of fun. Um, I've worked with you know people like Flume personally, which was really nice, and and lots of other sort of Perth based and, and national artists. So yeah. it's uh, coming from a place of music um, and moving into a place of sort of more open ended creativity, which has been really nice. Prior to all of this, like. What was your early life like? Like in terms, like you're born and bred. In yeah, Paris? I was born born in Fremantle. Fremantle, yeah, yeah, East Fremantle. Born and bred. Represent. Still go for the West Coast Eagles though. Oh no, so, got to man, got to do. Bro. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I to be honest with you, like uh, it's funny because my my dad was a musician, my mum was a dancer, but wow. me personally, I I never really had um any kind of creative outlet as mm-hmm. a kid. Um, even through high school, even through university, I was never really a creative person. Um, but I got into martial arts sort of late high school and that really sort of lit a fire in me about, I don't know, about sort of working at something and, and, you know, you, in martial arts, you kind of, you do one punch over and over and over and over again and Mm -hmm. one kick over and over and two, the technique's perfect. And so that sort of mentality of sort of like inch by inch, millimeter by millimeter kind of really became important to me. Mm And when my time in martial arts ended, I had a bit of a busted knee and, you know, I was, I was getting old and um, I, I sort of felt like I needed something else to, again, have that millimetre by millimetre, inch by inch mm. sort of approach. And, yeah, I had a friend who he recommended I get a photographer. He was a musician and mm-hmm. he was like, hey, come shoot my shows. Nothing narcissistic about it. But <laughs> but he was like, come. So you, know. so, so you weren't... Um a photographer then already? No, 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 so, no. So he just wanted he just, someone. Well, he just suggested it. He it was during the whole like five D sort of craze where all of a sudden the the Canon five D was the yeah, number the, one camera going around, release, and yes. everyone was like, "Oh, you can you can shoot video, you yeah. can shoot stills, and it's you know." It was a stable back yeah. then. Yeah, and he yeah, he recommended I check it out um, and and try it, and and my work at the time I was working for a university, uh, and part of my job was in communications. Mm-hmm. And so I had a little bit of sort of like building newsletters and building prospectuses. And so there's a right. little bit of sort of like... The marketing. Uh, yeah, marketing. A little bit of interest in, yes. in image. Um, and yeah, so I bought the camera. It's sat on my shelf for six months, which I'm sure a lot of people can yeah. kind of attest to. And then sort of one day I was like, well, I, you know, I sunk three or four grand into this camera lens. I better learn how to use it. And so I started going out and shooting and the, my photos were terrible. Yeah. I was like, what am I doing? And I used to go to this place called Mojo's in Fremantle, which mm-hmm. is a, a live music venue. And it's the kind of place, you know, you can get into with no shoes on, yeah. hat. You can dress however you want. You know, you can go out the back and you can smoke all kinds of yeah. illicit things. I'm not going to drop that too hard. But, you know, it's a really free place. Yeah. Um, so I used to go there a couple of times a week and shoot shows, um, you know, hang out with my friends, take photos of them. And it was there that I really started to sort of like – develop a real connection to light and color and mm-hmm. and image and and just sort of how to sort of be around strangers and yeah. capture them without sort of being too much in their face or, or getting in their way. Um, and I actually had my first ever photo lesson at Mojo's. I was running around with this lens on. All my photos were blurry. They were looking terrible. Yeah. And there was a guy shooting video there and he he saw that I was struggling and he came up to me. He's like, oh, you know, how are you going? 
you know, how are your photos going? And I said, oh, man, they're terrible. They're all really blurry. Yeah. And he looked at the camera and he looked at the lens and he, and he said, okay, you need to do this. And I had apparently I had a, the worst lens on I could for low light. So he's like, you know, what other lenses you got? I said, oh, I got this 50 mil in my bag. So he gets the 50 out, he puts it on my camera, he changes a few settings and says, check this out. And it was like, bang, straight away. I was like, oh, man, that's so much better. It's like, thanks so much, dude. And so from like that little lesson, my first sort of like lesson, it kind of got me into, you know, thinking about lens, thinking about shutter, how does it all kind of really work? Really deep into really, really, yeah, yeah, it was the first yeah. sort of like, oh, so this is how it all works. And then from there, just, yeah, it. from there I've been uh, just shoveling the fuel into the fire since then. Like, and and did, did you have supportive parents when, I guess, when you wanted to get into this sort of unorthodox or uh, unconventional? Well, my, my dad... <laughs> I haven't seen my dad for a very long time. Right. Um, you know, he's he's on his own journey, mm. um, which is, you know, I, I think as I've, you know, I'm, I'm 35 now, I, I, I kind of reached that stage where it's it's not, oh, like, you know, I don't I don't have a father figure or I didn't have a father figure growing up. And yeah. it's more just like, you know, he's a, he's a human being, he's living his life mm. and, and, you know, I appreciate him bringing me into this world and, right. and I, hope he's, I hope he's healthy and he's well. Um, and my mum... You know, she she tends to, to err on the side of caution yeah. a lot. And so me, you know, I had a really stable job at a government position at a university. It was yeah. paying, you know, really, really well, permanent contract. This is after martial arts. This is after martial arts. Is the, is after martial arts. Yeah. And this is, this is the dream, right? The, yeah. the, the government contract, yes. permanent contract. Yeah. And I kind of threw it all in after owning a camera for like, you know, a few months. Yeah. And I was like, I just, I remember sitting down in my boss's office and saying to him, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to quit. And he's like, well, why are you quitting? And I said, I'm going to become a photographer. And he laughed. I never forget it. Um, you know, and he said, well, good luck with that. You know, he, he had, you know, and, and my mum was freaking out. My wife was freaking out. And, and everyone was like, oh, what are you doing? You know, this is, this is the worst decision you could make. And, um, and I was like, no, 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 I, I, I think this is the right, the right move for me. And I think kind of doing that kind of put a pressure on me. To, to make it work. You know, I had the faith of my mom, I had the faith of the reluctant faith of my wife yeah. and everyone around me to kind of make it work. And so I think that having that kind of incentive of, you know, all in yeah. mentality mentality, and, and then I'm having to, I have to justify it and I have yeah. to prove to them that it was the right decision. Um, and I think that really helped to sort of keep that motivation when yeah. things might not have always been awesome or it was tough or I wasn't making any money, which took a really long time yeah. to, to, um, to get to a place where you can sit back and go, yeah, I'm, I'm now making a salary yeah. from this. That's, it's, it's, yeah. it's, I really love the two words you used, reluctant faith. And I think that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a really, really cool phase, uh, phrase because uh, with most, you know, I'm, I, I come from a very conventional, uh, you know, brown household essentially. Yeah. And, and I think with Asian families as well, as you know, you don't really get to pick uh, a career path that's, uh, that's out of the usual yeah. conventional ways, yeah. right? And they generally tend to expect something out of you in one of the main traditional ways. And I guess uh, part of it, you know, with, with with many who do break out from that um, circle, they pick that that reluctant faith from their surroundings and peers yeah. and families, and and um, some even don't have that faith on them. Yeah, um, literally, like you know, you do your own thing. It's yeah, yeah, you good good I'm, luck to you. Yeah, good luck to you. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm out. I'm out. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's it's interesting that you because it's I think with with our partners and parents it it, it shows a bit of care as well that you know like I care about you. Yeah. At the same time, I want you to do what you want to do. Yeah. Kind of it's it's quite interesting. Oh, I never I never thought like I'm gonna you know I'm gonna prove you wrong, my wife. It was it, yeah. it was no, yeah. I, I understood what what was going on. It was you know she it came from a good place. It was it was ser- as long as I'm serious about it, mm. she's gonna trust me. You know, and that that's that actually comes from a place of respect, yeah. I think, as opposed to uh, to a, as a place of looking of down. Looking down, yeah. It's yeah. like a, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I want you support. I want to support you. I want you to be successful. But I need from you. I need the energy and the effort, yeah. and I need to be able to see that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, just just before coming in, you were talking about how you wake up at eight, eight, 8 a.m. kind of thing. Oh yeah, and you, know, you <laughs> wished you could get up earlier. Oh, hundred um, percent. And and uh, which tells me that you have a disciplined uh, lifestyle, and, and I think you picked up a lot of that from from martial oh, arts. Hundred um, percent. Yeah. On a personal note, like you know, I uh, as a creative, I actually struggle 
having certain you know routine and disciplines and stuff like that i feel actually that hinders my creative side of things but it seems like it's quite the opposite for for you i mean, I mean what are, what's your experience with having disciplines and routines to i guess Within, enhance creative yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's tough because i i can be i can be both sides i can okay. be up to three four a.m just grinding away yeah. going nuts wife saying why aren't you coming to bed on time you know i'm just yeah. smashing away yeah. but i, I I think it goes like I said just before like I think it's and for me it's it's development inch by inch. Mm. So I never look at anything and think I am going to be this guy now. Yeah. I'm I'm going to be amazing at this or I'm going to have this attitude or I'm going to have this work ethic. It's for me it's always been little by little. Mm. And so as long as you have the sort of the goal in mind, you know, you have the end goal, you just kind of keep making those little changes in your lifestyle yeah. to just slowly improve yourself, you know. And and I think having that that ability to wake up early and and be really focused and 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 have a a rhythm to your creative creativity because again like I said I I I'm not a I'm not a big proponent of the the idea of creativity being this mythical mythical beast right. that we have to battle and if I'm not inspired today then I can't create but that doesn't seem like a a a, a fun, like a really healthy way of approaching creativity for mm. me personally mm-hmm. you know I I I look at it more as a as a practice as a as a as a as techniques as as you know there's there's there's, there's kind of rules that I've all put in place around my projects yeah. um that that kind of guide the work and and I feel like that you know the the more I sort of improve those little things day by day you know I I see the that my confidence and my creative output just getting better and better and better and it's it's you know I call it I call my you know the energy around my work I call it a spark right, right? so it's like and and you and for me I've got to fuel that spark mm-hmm. I've got to consistently and you know whether it's getting up early or decisions to take on more personal projects or more right. creative projects and take more risks I'm always trying to look at ways to just sort of keep that spark going mm-hmm. and not not let it be dulled by by the world because you know I'm sure we'll get into it later but creativity is hard you mm-hmm. know being a creative is hard mm-hmm. putting you know sitting in a boardroom with trying to buy 10 15 other yeah. creatives and presenting your ideas to them yeah. and sitting there confidently that's not an easy thing to do no. you know and 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 that's again you know i i it wasn't something that i was able to do straight away it was i guess especially going into the 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 um actually b- before i go into that uh, it's interesting you bring up that how you th- you mentioned that we look at creative it is like this the thing you need to be inspired yeah. by every day um i follow uh, this marketing guy called uh, Seth Godin he's super into the like you know writing and things like yeah. that right so he says that how how creative block is usually a subconscious excuse to not produce yeah in the sense that you know if you've got creative block it's you don't lose your ability to create at all no. you just lose your ability to create something you personally think is good. Yeah. So for example, if you sit down to write something, it's not like you've forgotten how to write. No. You've forgotten how to write as good as you think you might. Yeah. So his antidote to that is that you create regardless. Yeah. You re- like like show me your crap work. Yeah. Every day, show me your crap work if you're in a creative rut. Yeah. Because that will tell me that you are still doing something and then in a way that actually helps you I guess hone that cre- oh, 100% piece that you mentioned. I yeah. think that's yeah. really in alignment with the way you think. 100%, you know, it's it's it goes back to to martial arts, you know. I I can I can punch, sure I can punch, but can yeah. I punch with the right technique? No. Can I do that after 2 years? Probably not. After 5, then maybe I can. Yeah. And it's yeah. that that ability to keep punching, yeah. you know, to to keep Brilliant. keep creating just, you know, by habit, right? Rather than by inspiration. inspiration and you know you you find you know i think you you have a more healthy connection to what you're making than than constantly tackling the uh the beast of inspiration or um you know yeah that's a gem right there man yeah. like who said like like creating by habit and not by inspiration i think yeah. that's that's just such a super um super way of looking at it because many creatives especially you know including myself I have always had the idea that you need to have every, like the stars aligned yeah. before you can yeah, yeah. get into that zone and then go into deep work and create <laughs> at like 4:45 a.m. in the morning kind of thing yeah. um and I've seen that definitely yeah, yeah, there. yeah and I think I think it's that ment- mentality shift that I'm in personally as well where I'm trying to do more yeah. um even if it's crap Uh, yeah. and and then hopefully you know it builds builds towards us so i think it's it's really cool one thing you mentioned as well is how creative it is super hard for 
for most, especially when you're in that you know boardroom with other 15, 20 creatives who are there like, to, to jump to judge on you. your, yeah, yeah, to judge yeah, yeah, you yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's super hard again for a creative because it's such a part like like your ideas make you who you are, and then you put it out in the open. Yep. And then you've got 15, 20 other people in the same caliber, even better than yeah, yeah. you at what you do, um, tearing it apart yeah, into shreds. It's interesting because I guess for many creatives, like even for myself, where I'm not working with or for others, you can actually face that. Yeah. But when you get into that, I guess, bigger projects, when you're working with, you know, Tame Impala, for example, and I'm going to get into that later. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, I'm really going to get into that later. <laughs> um, and also, like, say, you know, uh, big universities or big corporate brands yeah, and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Um, how, how do you tackle that? Because that's something I haven't faced yet where I have to present, like, in front of 15 other creatives. If you, if you took me back, like, six years, you know, six, eight years when I started, I, I couldn't have done it. There's, there's no way. Um, and it, it just and it just goes back to, again, what we're just talking about in – for me to to be still like, I'd like I'd love to be still creating when I'm 70 80 years old. I'd still love to be chasing images, chasing shots, chasing stories. And so to to do that, you need longevity in your career. Yeah. And and I feel like if I'm if I'm constantly relying on inspiration that we mm-hmm. talked about and and the and sort of making my work really stressful around me and and putting so much pressure and stress on myself, I'm probably not going to survive till I'm 70 or 80 and mm. I'm probably not going to have the passion either. So it was part of it was, and this, this again, this goes back to, to my practice of Falun Gong, a spiritual practice was yeah. to always be able to look inside myself and slowly chip away at the things that would interfere with my ability to create and to, to, to express and to talk and to have confidence in what I'm doing. And, you know, and I'm sure all creatives can attest to, there's a million things that get in the way mm. of, of us being able to create. Um, and yeah. And so, you know, after eight years of, of shooting all the time and, and doing various different projects and rolling the dice on lots of yeah. things and, and taking risks, you kind of, for me, I kind of got to a stage where it, it didn't really matter anymore. I'd right. failed enough. Yeah. I've had enough people dislike yeah. what I do. I've had enough people yeah. like what I do. Yeah. I've, I've had it all and I'm still here. I still haven't lost that spark. I haven't yeah. lost that original passion and energy for what I do. And so then when I go into a, to a, to a meeting now what's the most important thing for me isn't to impress anyone i'm not trying to win a job but i'm trying to to sort of keep chipping away at the things inside me that get in the way of me creating and 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 i feel like now like when i go into a meeting or present documents or i feel excited and i feel you know i feel like i I i'm i'm not really caring about the outcome yeah and i feel like i feel like when when you when you're like that and you're presenting to people I think they they can tell they can feel the confidence the and the, the authenticity yeah. and, and the enjoyment yeah. and and to be honest man like you know like I, I feel like that's what clients want clients want someone who's going to come and be excited about what they want to make and be excited what they're going to make for the company yeah. and they they and they're going to these people are going to be creative and they're mm-hmm. going to bring passion and you know I, I think you know the more you can wear your passion on your sleeve and and trust in it foolishly you know. Mm-hmm. The more sure you're gonna have some terrible, you know, I, I, I'll speak about one later where yeah. things went terribly wrong. But you know, you, you'll have more wins than you have losses, yeah. and you're not gonna win everything. And I think that's a, that's a I guess, lesson yeah, for life yeah. in general. Go into the yeah. go into the terrible. Uh, oh yes, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I actually have a question later down where I said, "What's your biggest, I guess, failure and any learning from it?" This well, could let's, be. Let's drop that in right now. Yeah, <laughs> some so maybe not my biggest, but it was it was one that hurt the most. So I got a really, really big project for a New York company from a Sydney, really cool Sydney agency that I, that I was so stoked to be working with. And it was a it was a it was a week long shoot in in the country, um, working with you know a director from America, and I was a, I was a stills photographer on this project, and and you know there's a New York company and French, and it was all these big names. I was like, oh man, this is so sick. This is just a guy from Perth, and I'm yeah. rolling all these these big wigs. Yeah. And I, and I get to day one and I'm, I'm shooting away and, and you know, and then I, I have to start presenting images to the client, and which I've never done before, like on a set as we're shooting, I'm presenting as we're shooting. And so I wasn't really set up for it. I didn't know really what the expectation was. And to be honest, I had never been briefed properly. And, and I'll, go, I'll go into sort of this, this sort of like learning from your mistakes, but learning from others' mistakes as mm-hmm. well. But I hadn't been briefed that well 
but I was I was confident. I spent a lot of time on set shooting. I spent a lot of time shooting with um with with camera crews in front of me. So I was shooting, 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 and when it got to the first review session, the client hated it. Hated everything I'd shot. And I said, "This is all wrong." Mm-hmm. And there's me by myself with this Sydney in this amazing production house, and all this. This is probably the biggest job of you know one of the biggest jobs of my career, and I just screwed it up. Mm-hmm. And 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 she hated me. Yeah. And and I and you know I hadn't been briefed properly because. They had other images, they had other photographers through other projects in other countries, but they'd never shown me any of them. And I explained that to them, but it didn't change her impression of me. Right. right? So the impression set. Mm. And so for the next five days of this shoot, I have this client who hates mm. just just who hates me. Yeah. Right. And I felt like I wanted to disappear. I wanted to vanish. I wanted to <laughs> hole in the middle. Yeah, I wanted, I, yeah, I just yeah, like, just oh, this, this is it. I'm done. Career's done. Career's over. When, when was this? Ah, uh, this was uh, early last year. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is it's interesting because just prior to this, you were talking about how you've built this big confidence, you know, yeah, level yeah. of, and then you've got, you've got this this project. Oh yeah, where I, it's, I was top it's of the testing, world. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. testing your every i guess you know ounce of yeah. of confidence in who you are yeah that's a hundred percent and i and and you know i i but but what, what i did though is i i tried to not let it get to me mm. and so i tried to really just like you know what like i'm gonna trust in my process trust in my work and i'm just gonna just gonna dig in and, and yeah. finish this job and not sort of like take a backward step in internally you know sure and and and, and finish the job and the irony is i finished the job Images sent off, you know, job's done. It took me about a year to then put those photos together and post them online because I had so low confidence in them. And then I put them together, I post them online, and it gets gets featured by Adobe. Yeah. So Adobe Behance features the images. Wow. And they, all, they, get, they get shown all around the world and, and all this praise on, on these images. And it just, it just goes to show, you know, like mm. in that, that moment at that time, I felt like I was – the worst photographer in the world yeah. didn't have a chance of, of ever doing anything good again. Yeah. But, you know, a year later and when the photos go out, they're amazing. People yeah. love them. Yeah. And so you, you, you never know, you know, like that, like the people you're working with, they, they'll have an opinion, but it's not a universal opinion, mm-hmm. right? And so you have to, so how do you tackle that? If you have a, a, a 7 billion people on the planet yeah. with all their own opinions, well, how do you tackle that? And it's like, well, you have to trust your own. Mm-hmm. Whether for, for, for better or worse, I think at the end of the day, you have to be able to look inside at yourself as a creative and go, I, I, I trust what I do. I may not be the best now. Mm-hmm. Maybe in 10, 15 years I'll be amazing. Yeah. But I still have to trust what I'm doing at this moment because, you know, you, you never know who, who's going to appreciate it, who's going to look at it, who's going to like it. Yeah, and I think also the, it, it also another angle that I personally take on is, is I ask myself, who is this work for? Yeah. Um, if it's for for me personally first and foremost, and then if it's for a certain crowd that I'm targeting towards, I'll value their opinion. Yeah. Um, but even if they hate it, like you know, I've done some client works and stuff. You know, I seriously do architecture. Uh, you know, it's my bachelor's degree in in at Curtin, and there it's, it's, it was kind of similar where you had to present um, your work and ideas in front of this jury who would basically critique your work in front of the entire class yep. you know uh, out in the open and sometimes you'd get like really really harsh comments more more often than not actually they really try to mold you for the probably for the industry yeah. right and it would like destroy so many of us and i oh, think yeah. <laughs> architecture is like one of the most highest dropout rates because most people can't you know like like, like stomach the, the harsh criticisms yeah. and i think in a way it shows that that we tend to question our worth based on the opinion specifically. Yeah. And I understand that, okay, maybe if I want to pass, I need to cater to the jury's opinion. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you're worthless because no. it could be great for someone else. Yeah. And and I think that that's the case in your, your well, it could, project. It could be terrible now, but in 10 years, yeah. you could be doing amazing things. Exactly. So it's, yeah, I have a, I have a friend who struggles with this a lot and he... He's a musician and and he's forever perfecting his craft, yeah. not showing it to anyone. Because mm. I think there's again there's that, that's like a tricky said, there's place that, to that, be. Yeah, there's that it's internal tricky, tricky battle, place right? To be. And he can get really stuck going too far the other way, mm. where it's like he produces just for himself. Yeah. And that's I'm not what I'm saying. I'm not saying is 
you be ignorant of the world yeah. and only th- make what you, you want to make. Just, you you just, won't be successful that no, way. No, no. Yeah. Because you, you know, you, you still want an audience. And what I say to him is like, you know, is an artist still an artist without an audience? Oh, that's a brilliant question. You know, like I, I think it's it's nothing wrong with, with wanting to impress people. There's nothing mm. wrong with wanting to make things that people are excited about and interested in. It's just you don't put everything into that. I think it's a scale, isn't it? Because yeah. I, think, I think once we do too little for the audience um, or intended audience, and then it's like, why should anyone care? Yeah. And then if you push way too far where you're just trying to make a buck and that's when the term sellout comes yeah. in. Like you're just selling out only to please others and yeah. not yourself. Yeah, and there's no personal journey Correct. there. There's no story. There's no yeah. nothing keeping you there when things go wrong because you're Absolutely. all in on other people's opinions. Yeah, I, I always look at, it, at, at that that's aspect of, of creativity as a as a conversation, mm. right? So you're not if if you if you're gonna have if you're gonna talk with someone and someone's just gonna shout in your face yeah. for five minutes and not listen to you, well, you're not really gonna be interested in that conversation, no, right? No. And that's what I feel like happens with those people who tend to dive in full self indulgently. Mm. They are shouting at me. They're saying, <laughs> "This is who I am. This is what I represent. I don't care what who you are, what you say. This is I'm amazing. Think you're all haters, yeah, right? And that's like I can't engage with that. Nah. And I, the way I look about it, to think about it is, it's a conversation, and it's a good, it's a good conversation. Exactly. You want to learn something, you want to yeah. hear them, even if you don't agree. Yeah. You still want to hear and and understand what this person is trying to express. And to I think you. that's that comes from a place of empathy that is so lacking right now in the world. I mean, obviously we're talking about creative side of things, but if you look into politics and oh, yeah. religion <laughs> and all that kind of stuff, like if you just go on an online forum or oh, yeah. social media, people shouting at each other, literally just yeah. shouting one without really taking the time to even consider where the other person might be coming from. Not a, yeah. And I think if you even have like an ounce of that mentality yeah. into even the ten percent of the world, we would definitely be in a much better place. Well, you could you could learn something. You know, like someone you might not agree with someone, but you could learn something from them. Oh, so or, much. or maybe you could learn from the conversation you had with them. You know, like I, I like I always I'll say when I go, I have little rules that yeah. I have in place when I do projects, and some of the things I do commercially is one of the rules I'll I'll, I'll establish at the start is that. There is such thing as a bad idea. Yeah. Let's not yeah, beat around no. the bush. There are bad ideas. Absolutely. There's, there's ideas. bad art. There's, there's bad, bad ideas. Art. Yeah. But what I say is, is a bad idea can lead to a good one. So don't not say it. Correct. Right. So still say your bad idea, even if you think it's bad, mm. and if other people think it's bad. But that conversation might spark the right idea. Exactly. So so you know, and I I so I make sure I say in any meeting that please, if you're in at this table, please suggest ideas, bring up ideas, talk about things and never think that you're going to be hated on for that idea because we might get to the right place by you saying that yeah. and we miss out on that opportunity. And, and, and I think the, the reason why people don't want to share you know, or be on display is because they, th- you know, first of all, they think you know, they're going to get ridiculed. Yeah. And the second idea is also because they, they feel that the, the, their thoughts entirely represent who they are, which... It's true, like a fraction of it does, but it's not. It shouldn't really count as your self worth. Like, no. if somebody says, "Okay, that's not a good idea," that doesn't mean you're worthless. And yeah. I think just getting out of the mentality, I think, allows one to then start sharing, yeah, their work, their ideas, and just putting stuff out in the world. Yeah, because you know, like I, you know, I'll, I'll direct, and, and normally in direction you'll have, you know, when you're doing a TV commercial, there'll be chains of communication, right? Yeah. So the the gaffer's assistant, you know, wouldn't talk to the director, mm. right? And and or you know, the, the the director won't be open to client ideas because mm. that you know this I, this is my creativity, and and for me, it's like that seems counterproductive. It seems like if I can put the project first, then anyone should be able to suggest an idea, yeah. and mm. it could be a terrible idea, and I can you know dismiss it. Mm. But what if it's an amazing idea? What if the gaffer's assistant comes up to me and goes, "Hey, if you." What about this for the shot? And I'm going, you know what, dude? That's actually the best idea. Yeah. Like, let's do that. You know, I'm I'm really open to that so conversation. So many great and stuff it, comes from like just accidents and some, yeah. you know, from just some random random dude. things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and also I've heard so many cases where where people just put stuff out there. Initially, they thought no one's gonna like it. Yeah, no one's gonna appreciate it, and then it becomes one of their you know, biggest hits. And, yeah. Um. So far, so I think I think it's just a really really important topic. Um, with your work as well, you've got so many different disciplines right now. You started with still photography, and now yeah. you're doing you know one of the video, uh, and you're doing you know color grading. There's so many different things that you do. I guess what's the hardest part in 
managing a multidisciplinary oh, UI. Oh, man. It's, it's probably the hardest part is feeling like you're good at any one of them. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, there's, there's so oh. many moments I feel like, man, like, you know, maybe I really am, you know, the sort of like the jack of all, master of none. Yeah. And, and then, I feel you, bro. Yeah, I feel and that you. can be, feel really tough. And, and, then, and then it's like, you know, then you see your friends who are like, Maybe they've chosen a lane to be yeah. in, and they're crushing it. They're brain surgeons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're they're just lawyer. Yeah, and you're just like, bruh, like, you know, who like, are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, 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 yeah, this, yeah. this, this. Yeah, you know. And and I think I think there's also you know there's there's also a thing for working commercially is is you you will get a reputation for something. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. You get a reputation as the assistant camera person, yeah. or the reputation as the DOP, or as yeah. the director, and that gets really hard to change once you're in that lane. And you're, fun, you're, you're sort of like the money starts coming in. It's very hard to convince any agency that you're something else yeah. once once you've once you want to change. And so for me, it, it became about, and again, this goes back to my spirituality and, and my martial arts. Is it's about it's about creating like my own philosophies, my own ideas, and my own purpose for my work. Whether right. it's so it's from color grade to the shot selection to the shot type to the, all those things become part of your DNA mm. as as an artist. And so I, I tend to look at myself not as a just a director or just a photographer, or just a DO, whatever it is I'm doing. It's it's more of a, a philosophy attached to an artistic endeavor. Mm. And you know whether it's directing or it's DOPing, I'm able to shift that philosophy and into different lanes yeah. and still have the same set of rules or same set of expectations and standards that I can apply depending on the role. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. I think it's also that that, that re- referrals that come through in the corporate world as well where where what do people refer you for? At the moment? No, no, no. Oh, I, yeah, I, I'm oh, yeah, not like, specifically yeah, for yeah, you, but in general because one. you're doing five or six different things. Yeah. You're not known as that one guy thing. Oh yeah, or one thing guy. Sorry. Yeah, I, I just did a, did a TV commercial recently where I was director, DOP, and color grader. Yeah, you know, and I was like, that's cool. Like that's yeah. that's really cool. Like to to be able to have the trust from a you know a, an agency, a big agency, to shoot TV commercials and be able to manage all these different aspects of yeah. it. Um, yeah, it's 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 really cool, and I and I, I do appreciate that trust yeah. afforded to me when when that kind of stuff happens. But yeah, sometimes I think. Maybe I should just be a director. Just want maybe to. I should just just be a photographer. But I, I can't help but be excited. Yeah. By the shiny object. The possi- Yeah, the shiny objects and the possibilities. Yeah. And you know, there's some nights I'll stay up hell late. This is. Yeah. I'm st- I still do it. And I'll just be researching lenses. Exactly. And the next day I'm researching color grading. Yeah. And the next day I'm I'm looking at treatments that different directors make. The the, the kind of. I just get excited by it all, and it, it all. Yeah, and uh, I, I get you know sucked into this. Yeah, you know, I call it the, the shiny object syndrome because I want to do so many things, yeah. and yet you know the, there's this battle going on. Like you said, that should should peop, the world values experts, yeah, and yet you know I struggle focusing on on one thing because I really enjoy doing ten things. Yeah, so I think it's really that internal battle. So one of the things that I've seen uh, with again you know being multidisciplinary is that you used to do um, concert photography, you know, general still photography for brands, going into the videography, color grading, DOP. There's so many different avenues that you're in right now. Um, how have you ever worked on multiple projects at the same time, but with different oh, yeah. roles in them? And and how oh, yeah. do you navigate like you know two different sides of your creative fields? It's really it's really hard. I find. Like I'll, you know, I, I worked with with Flume, which was amazing on yeah, this. Yeah. Hi, this is Flume mixtape, and my my job was twofold: it was to do stills for the artwork and for tour merch and things like that, but also to shoot video, uh, BTS video, and these little uh, loop videos that you'll yeah. find on his his YouTube and, and Instagram and stuff. And you, it's like you you're having to think in two different lanes at the same yeah. time. You're thinking, well, does this shoot still? Or is this a better video? And what's and I couldn't. Like I, I actually don't like it. Right. I, I actually prefer having if I if I'm once I'm working, yeah. having one focus. Either right. I'm the director or I'm the DOP mm. or I'm doing still, whatever it is that I'm doing. I prefer that. But again, it goes back to that idea of like challenging. Yeah. You know, and and, and just sort of like just diving in. You know, you know what? Screw it. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this and, and I'm gonna go nuts and I'm yeah. gonna run around. Like I mean like there were times on like the high this is flown tape where I had three cameras around me. I had two stills cameras on me, and I had a 
I had a, a video camera on me and I was running around. I'd oh. drop the video camera, pull the stills out, bang, 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 switch over, shoot video. And, you know, there's, and I, and I really, really sort of enjoy that, that sort of chase. Yeah. And I was listening to an interview um, with, I think, Robert Richardson. I think it's Robert Richardson, who's the, the DOP for, for Tarantino. Mm-hmm. And he was saying that when he first started um, shooting out of university, he was yeah. working with a journalist. And they were shooting a war in like South America, something, something mm-hmm. going on, civil, civil unrest or something. And he had his camera with him, and they were with some soldiers, and then they, the soldiers got under fire. And so he took his camera and he was hiding behind a rock, like this is insane. And he said the journalist ran up to him and said, "What are you doing? You need to shoot." And he's like, "Well, this, this bullet's firing. People are going to shoot me." And he's like, "No, no, no. You're here to shoot, so you shoot." And so he said from that point on that he just shot everything. And he shot with a, a sort of a relentless energy. And that something really appealed to me, that kind of that all-in mentality. Yeah. It was like this bullets whizzing past him and this guy is just shooting, shooting through shooting video. So it's like, well, it's if insane. I'm if I'm on set and I just have to have three cameras and I have to juggle two jobs, well, that's yeah. not the hardest thing in the world, no. you know. Like and I and I should just just commit, just go for it yeah. and see what happens. And then, and then that project went went really, really yeah, well. No, of, it's, uh, yeah. I've I've seen you know, uh, obviously when we uh, met last week, um, just to catch up, you were just dropping these names like there are Oh yeah, it's working fluent, oh there's a taming parlo, and I'm like, dude, like you're literally working with all some of my biggest idols right there. Um but I guess my, my next you know, question then goes into how, what's it like working with big names? And these are global names. Um I know you know you're based in Perth and generally people in Perth are quite laid back and stuff yeah. but at the end of the day these are global uh, work that you're producing and, yeah. and with the flume um project uh, you know i think it was on, on billboards uh, even in yeah. the new york times square uh, it was in times square yeah yeah that, that, that's pretty rad world. man yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like, so so what's it like working with with these big creatives on a personal level and of course you know with with, with kevin parker from tame yeah. Impala recently um yeah just just walk me through the, the whole process I, I just try and keep it really chill i, I try and you know, not change anything, not, yeah. not think about it too much. Um, and I just try and have fun, you know, and, and, and bring my, my personality, my energy to the work. Mm. And, you know, and hopefully they, they, I can connect with them and yeah. we can do some cool work and hang out. We can chat. Um, I try not to think about fame and, and all those kind of things too much. It, it's, you know, it's not the point. Like I yeah. said, for me, all those things are secondary. They're all byproducts of, of the hard work and, and the commitment and the energy you put in. Mm. So, um, but though you have to be careful around social media though, is I got a funny one with Flume, but you know, that the, the management and the teams around them can be very funny and very particular. So what I find is the artists are usually very chill, but yeah. it's the management and that's exactly that, what that, I mean. That, where yeah. things get really stressful. Correct, correct. Um, and so, you know, you have to be careful with social media, you know, like I, because they're they're that famous, the wrong thing gets leaked, yeah. or the wrong I post the wrong image, or I, yeah. I post a BTS and it gets you know shows the artist in not mm. quite the right light or the right yeah, that I'd like yeah. to be known in, and then I will have management come down on me and, yeah. and and which is not very nice. But yeah, I had one thing with Flume where I was on his tour through Asia, and he had these um, tour passes right that the, all the crew would wear, mm. and they were they were magic cards. I don't know if you know magic cards, yeah, yeah. Magic the Gathering. Yep, yep. And they were magic cards and they had this amazing design. And I used to play magic as a kid and right. I, I used to be, you know, I was, I was off the moon. And so I, I took a photo and sent it to a friend. I was like, yeah. man, this is so sick. Yeah. That ended up getting leaked to Reddit. Oh, no. <laughs> and it went all around, it went out everywhere. And the management knocked on my door throughout like a, the next day and they're like, mate, like, did you take this photo? And I'm like, oh, bro. And, and he's like, yeah, you, you gotta, you gotta delete it. And, you know, now we're for, for the Australian leg of the tour, we have to, we have to change all the tour passes and oh, it's gonna, out. yeah, cost us five, 10 grand. And I was just like, shoot me now, you know, like, <laughs> damn it, bro. Like, I just took it, showed it to a friend and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, we've had it before and just, you know, just, just letting you know. And, yeah, that 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 really sucks. Yeah, that's another that's another moment where you feel like you want to disappear into yeah. a, into a hole. That's a learning curve for you. Yeah, yeah. And the next, you know, a few ones, you know what to do and what not to yeah. do. Yeah, well, it's funny because I I wouldn't normally do stuff like that. Mm. Um, I think it's one thing that I think artists appreciate from what I've learned is if you don't make really make a big deal about who they are yeah. and what they're doing, um, yeah, and you just you're there they as are a human being. Yeah, 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 and you're there as another yeah. human being to just. You know, do some work together and bring a good vibe or good energy, then and that's enough. And jumping on social media to shout them out all the time and be like, "Hey, I'm out here," yeah, you know, with yeah. my boy. Like, 
Sometimes I don't really appreciate that. And they, no, they I like think a, the, that yeah. definitely makes sense because, you know, they get that a lot. Yeah. Every day, every waking day especially. And I guess the antidote to that is appreciating someone who's just more down to earth. And, yeah. You know, just treating them as actual human beings. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, my question actually was, was from the angle of, you know, working with their big, you know, when I say big names, working with the crew and the management yeah. and stuff, because it's a different ball game to, I guess, working with someone who's, I guess, you know, on a more local, on yeah. a more, you know, grounded, grounded basis. So I guess the difference would be uh, with, with, with the more local stuff, it's, it's less management. Stuff. Yeah, it's directly with the artist. It's, artist yeah. You know, you're not really dealing with a manager often and you're not really dealing with tight turnaround times and there's a lot of creative flexibility mm. and, there's, and there's not as much risk yeah. involved. You know, there's not as much creative risk and, and expectation, which is, it's good and bad because it means yeah. you can go nuts. Yeah. You know, you can really, a lot of freedom to a lot of freedom with, to yeah. whatever you want. You don't have to really consider any of the, the greater sort mm. of like outreach that the project's mm. going to have. Um, but I think you still you still want to bring that same spirit though into mm-hmm. working with bigger names. I think yeah. I think you still want to go nuts and, and take risks, and you don't want to play it safe. Yeah. I feel like that that's not why you're there. You know, you're not you're not there to to go. Oh, this is now Flume. I have to be really careful with the photos I take of him. Yeah, yeah. You st- I think you still want to you still want to go nuts and and give your heart heart to the project, and you just have to be more careful around. Where your photos go, mm. and and just dealing with management. So, so I guess how much of uh, the creative output does the artist have in in, in, in things like this? Because you recently worked with Kevin Parker yeah. on um, a photo shoot for a yeah. magazine. So I guess in in cases like that, like do they have a say, or does their team already decide what to do and they just rock up and it's done and done? And I guess this is you know the question is more from the point of obviously you know on a personal level, a yeah. big fan of. Ke- Kevin and and it would be a dream to work with him on a creative yeah. project. You know, you will actually aspire to work with such amazing creatives. So, as a creator, when someone wants to get into these higher, you know, projects with with amazing creatives, uh, what would they, I guess, have to look out for? Like, do they just get these jobs, or do they apply for it? Like, like how does the process become? Well, I, for me, it's it's all been reputation. I don't I don't have a really massive social media following. Mm. I, I I've never really put that much stock into it. I really should. That's not a saying that it's not good. I, I have friends who have, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers and, yeah. and they, they crush it all around the world. It's just for me personally, it's not yeah. something that I've actively I've done. Acted, yeah, and, and and it doesn't it's not really again, it's not really my Your the thing. purpose of what I'm yeah. chasing yeah. Yeah. in in life. And um and so it's never really things have always come by reputation mm. or by um sort of uh word of mouth. Yeah. 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 Um and the things so yeah but the things you have to be careful of is is you have to be strong with management. So mm-hmm. so so music management managers love them, but you have to you have to know where to draw the line with them, and you have to be strong with with who you are, what the expectations are, and um, and uh, and uh, like and money. Yeah, right. Of so yeah. you have. So, and this is probably one of the hardest lessons I've had to learn mm-hmm. as as a creative person is is managing, uh, you know, being able to say this is how much I cost, this is how much it's worth, yeah. this is you get just these four things, nothing more. And if you ask for anything else, then you have to pay X amount for this. Mm-hmm. And when, so when you go into that higher tier world where you have you know big money and you have management and all these people, then you have to start being really strong with your your sort of your pricing and the expectations of a project and the outcome because you'll get eaten up. Yeah. You know, I, I'm sure people have, have heard about burnout, you know, creative yeah. burnout, all yeah. that kind of stuff. If you don't protect yourself as you, as you move up in the world, you'll just be, they'll just come for you and they'll yeah. just tear every little bit of creativity they can out of you. Mm. And then when you're too stressed or too exhausted or too depressed to work anymore, well, they're going to stop contacting you. Right. And you're like, well, well, you thought you guys were my friends and, yeah. you know, well, help a brother out. Well, no, they're too busy working with another creative now because mm. they've, you know. So you're kind of replaceable yeah. from that aspect it's, and that sucks. Yeah. So you have to, you, you really are. So you have to, you have to be able to learn to guard yourself and, and guard, you know, look at, you into your own self and think am i okay am i okay with this price at this outcome yeah. what am i okay with mm-hmm. um and having a bit of faith in yourself that if you if a manager or you know someone contacts you and they, they say hey dude we have this budget we have this amazing opportunity sometimes being able to say no 
and and sort of go, you know what, that's not enough for me. Yeah. And if you want me, it's going to cost this much. And if they say no, you have to learn to be okay with that mm-hmm. because other things will come. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, you you know going back into the the the, the fanboying on on Tame Impala. So yeah. how how's Kevin Parker like to work with? He's just he's a really chill guy. Yeah. You know, I've I've worked with him a bunch um, throughout the years on lots of different random things, and I was on tour with them. Mm-hmm. Oh, it would have been I'm not sure when. Maybe 2014, 15. Yeah. They're um, just coming into the, the global scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was on tour with a friend, some friends of mine who were the support act, Koi, Koi Child. Yep, Koi Child. Um, and yeah, and he's just, he's very chill, you know, like I, I he, reco- he recorded their album or he produced their album for Koi Child and, you know, we were on an island in Mandra. Wow. A fishing, fishing island, mm. right? So we're, there's about 10 of us in a fishing shack. Mm. Um, you know, that, that's as old as, you know, it's 50 years old and it's, yeah. it's got no love into it. And, and you had to bring your own mattress and blankets, all yeah. that kind of stuff. And so the mattresses that the guys would sleep on were the mattresses they put up in the walls for their sound. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 So, so cool. And then, and that's, you know, and Kevin's just chilling, you know, yeah. he's sleeping on a mattress in the middle of Mandra on a tiny island, oh, what a sleeping on a mattress. And then the day he gets up and he puts that mattress up and they make sound, different sound booths for the horn section, for the rapper and, um, you know, and I got, and he's just walking around shirtless with a VB in his hand, sipping away, and it's like, you know, it's he's a very, very chill, yeah, yeah. Fremantle guy, yeah. You know, and it's it's very rare to be honest that I haven't really read, met an artist that isn't really actually just chill, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, it's you take you take them out of the the spotlight of yeah. just a human being, yeah, you know, exactly, just a dude or just a chick. And I think I think and I think that's what um, increases the the you know authenticity of the artist and, and and fans can see that yeah um i mean even if you didn't tell me this i i would be pretty certain that they, they, they you know because a super chill dude and yeah. just making yeah. music and because he loves doing that stuff and yeah. even there was no spotlight he'd still be doing that yeah 100 percent. you know 100 percent. and that's yeah. and actually you touch on a really important point there and i think that's probably the biggest lesson for any creative is like if there's if there's no audience you're still doing it yeah and that's you know that's i think that should be the first the aim. first, the first, aim. the first, yeah, yeah, is it's just, there. it's just like treasure that mentality and go nuts, and and create like nobody's watching, mm. and then when when people are watching, then you can I can have fun. Yeah. You can you know you already got the the attitude and the the work ethic mentality. to just have some fun with it. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, a bit of a tangent on this one. Um, you you released a you know you published a book as well. A, a, yeah, a, yeah, a photo book and and. Um, it's interesting because you mentioned how you left your job early in the early days and you had a naysayer, yeah. essentially. And when we were speaking about this off record, uh, you also, um, when you pitched the whole book idea, uh, there was also a few naysayers. So uh, I actually want to you know, go deep into, into the whole idea of, of how it came about and how you kind of worked around people just saying, you know, like, that's not going to work. Uh, so so the, book, <laughs> the book's a funny story. It... Uh, I was because I'm still enrolled at Curtin University. Oh, wow. I, was, I haven't finished my, my degree, and and I originally started an education degree, which I was terrible at, and then it, it morphed into a photography degree later. Mm-hmm. But I, I went back as when I was already an established photographer so, to try and finish because I have this hex debt, this government debt for um, my university. So I was like, oh, well, might as well get something from it. So I was I was uh, working on a project for the for the year, and it was a photography book mm-hmm. project. And the tutor, would, you know, he'd go around from person to person. What are you going to do? Are oh, you going to take photos of your friends playing basketball? Are yeah. you going to take photos of food? Da, da, da. And he comes to me and he's like, so what are you thinking about doing? And I was like, oh, I might go up north into Pilbara and, and shoot on a cattle station. And he was like, oh, you sh-, you know, he was like, are you sure you want to do that? Doesn't sound like a very good idea. You know, like how are you going to find a farm? Farms are not that nice. It's hard work. Like, you know, do you want something easier? Mm. And I said, no, 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 I, I think this is the right idea for me. And so I literally just disappeared from university for two weeks. Um, <laughs> and I found a farm that would take me in the Pilbara and I, I drove two days, self-funded, um, up to the farm and they, they housed me and they fed me for two weeks. And I just followed around uh, station workers for two weeks mm. taking photos of them. And they didn't they, they didn't want me there either. They, they, were, they were really suspicious of me. They were like, who's this bloke with the camera? Why is he here? We're slowing our work down. Yeah. You know, like, you know, I'd be off shooting something and I'd hear one of the workers going, Oi, Dan, get over here. Stop wasting your time. We got to go to this place. And I'm like, oh, sorry, guys. And ran over. And it was about, you know, a week in and that sort of stopped. And it, and it went from 
them being like, why is this blog here? Mm. To, oh, come here, Dan. This is going to be a good, fo- good shot. Oh, you should go see these people. These people are doing something cool. Yeah. Um, and so I was able to kind of win them over with like sort of my passion and my, um, and my work, work ethic. Um, and then I came back to, to Perth and I, I put the book together and, and um, for that particular course, I got a C, a C mark. So I just passed. Yeah. But I was able, I had a connection with a publisher in Fremantle called Fremantle Press mm-hmm. and I was able to um, get the photos to them. And I said, hey, guys, I, I took these photos up north and you should check them out and um, let me know what you think. I'm thinking of maybe doing a book, if not now, maybe going and shooting again, but this mm-hmm. is like a test run. And they contacted me and said, hey, would you like to come in and have a chat about the photos you took? And I was like, yeah, cool. And I didn't really think much of it. And I got in there and they sat me down and said, we want to publish your book. Mm. Um, and that's pretty much yeah. how it happened. And then yeah. I went, you know, I, I, I stumbled into into sort of, uh, I had to do a book tour. Yeah. I had to do radio sessions. I had to do all kinds of like crazy things and newspaper articles about me, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and again, it just goes to show that, you know, I, I, I nearly failed that co- that course, yeah. right, that, that unit, but I was able to to publish a, 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 a book. book nationally that, you know, that's, that still sells. That still sells and, and, it's, and it's in the Western in, in here brilliant. if you're going there, yeah. have a look. It's called The book's called Dust, by the way. Yeah, I've seen it. It's, yeah. fun, it's beautiful. I yeah. love some of the images there. Thanks, thanks man. Um, yeah, and, and it's, again, you know, like I think if you're going to take a, a creative path, roll the dice. Yeah. You know, don't, don't play it safe because... It's not why you're there. No. Yeah. One other thing I ask, you know, every guest this question, uh, what is quality to you in terms of work? Oh, that's an epic question. And I think a question people don't think about enough. Mm. Um, I, I, I fit into the school of, I, I, I like the idea of quality. So then there's some people who will say, well, you know, beauty is now a beholder or, um, you know, it's creativity is subjective, which, which it is. Yeah. But I still think... You know, there is a there is a baseline. There's a there's a baseline of of standard, whether it's to do with composition or color or subject matter or I, and I, and I'm someone who who likes beauty mm. and I like things that that are aesthetically pleasing as well as sort of uh, creatively exciting as well as having sort of rich deep messages in them. But for me, the the baseline is is aesthetics mm-hmm. and aiming for aesthetic quality because I feel like Again, this goes back to what I said about having conversations with people. You know, the you know, if, if if creativity is a conversation between me and you, then the more eloquent my words and the more clear I am with what I'm saying, the easier it is for you to understand. Correct. I believe that's the same thing with with quality of work. Yeah. I believe that the, the stronger your image, the stronger your aesthetic, the more pleasing it is to to watch. Mm. Just like it is, the more pleasing it is to listen. Yeah the more your work will, cr- will cross into them or your messages yeah. will help, will, will be translated or picked up better by the viewer. And so I, I'm someone who, who yeah, I, I, I believe in, in quality and I believe yeah. it's a really important thing. And I think this, this idea of just I make what I make mm. for me and I think it's like, yeah, it, it's, you know, it, you need to have that confidence. You yeah. need to have that, that. But you also, like I said, you want to be able to, Speak elegantly to someone. Yeah. You yeah. know, I don't want to. I don't want to walk into a. You know, put my photo on a wall as an exhibition, and and for me, it feels like I'm just spitting on people as they walk yeah. past because I just don't give a shit. Yeah. Uh, because I don't That's care. Fine. Yeah. So you can, so yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, I want people to be able to look at it and, and feel a connection or, or feel something aesthetically pleasing, or have some. You know, be able to cross that line between mm. me and them. Mm. Um, yeah, and I think quality and aesthetic. It's I think I think you, the way I see it is you mentioned that how you said creativity is subjective. Yeah. Um, I actually think uh, the the work in itself, um, the work in itself is subjective. But sorry, um, how people consume your work is subjective. Yeah. But the way the the art in itself cannot be subjective in general because yeah. otherwise there would be no rules. Yeah. Hundred uh, percent. You know, like there wouldn't be. Yeah you know, a certain way of, of making things. And I think it needs to meet certain standards. And I think it yeah. all comes down to how an artist or creator yeah. tries to communicate. Because I think that's what something people also, you know, uh, look looks past when, it, when they talk about quality. Yeah. For example, you know, like a mainstream pop song um, is not for everyone, you know, yeah. you know, people who don't listen to pop songs, for example. But is it hitting the mark for people who actually listen to 
to pop songs. Yeah. And if it does, I think that's this quality in but yeah, in theory. Yeah. But when we talk about, for example, is it uh, is it as difficult or as as technical or as as uh, comprehensive in terms of creating it as opposed to something that's more that requires more thought and more yeah. thought provoking? Probably not. Yeah. So from on that scale, it's probably not as qualitative, you know. Yeah. Uh, compared to something that requires a lot more thinking and a lot more um, effort to it. So I think uh, how people consume content can be subjective. Consume creation can yeah. be subjective, and it is. Yeah. Because I may not like metal, and someone may yeah. like pop, yeah, and someone yeah, yeah, like pop. Yeah, yeah. But you could still judge that. Okay, this specific piece of work. Did not take as much thought or a hundred percent, you know, versus something else. Yeah, I, I that 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 idea, you know, I have I have friends and, and other artists who will say, or you know, ask them what it's about, and they'll go, oh, I don't know, you tell me, and that's like, I, I don't want that. I, I don't want to have a conversation with someone where everything is just a mirror in front of mm. me, and I have to make up what yeah. it's about. I appreciate the effort, I appreciate yeah. the narrative, I appreciate the story, I appreciate yeah. the quality of what the artist is trying to say, and Correct. I think. I think in a world now that is getting more complicated and messy and, and you know, we're becoming, like you said, like you go online, everyone's just shouting at each yeah. other to, to see work presented that's, that's telling you what it is and it's telling you what it's about and it has meaning and it has depth and, and it's attempting to, you know, sort of have, have, a, have a face and have a value. Yeah. I think in this day and, day and age, I think is, 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 is stronger. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, it, I feel like we've, we've we've pushed so long for you know for breaking the rules, right? Yeah. That's that's been the norm, right? Yeah. And, and and art is in a lot of popular art has been breaking the rules and how far can we push the envelope? Yeah. And I feel like we've gotten to the stage where the envelope has been pushed. We we've, yeah. we've pushed it all the way. Yeah. I think everything that can be done has been yeah. done in terms of breaking rules. Yeah. And so it's, for me now what's what's different? What's, yeah. you know, What's edgy is actually mm. the opposite, and it's going really, really, really traditional. Yeah, it's 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 staying within the rules. Yeah, and yeah. and and creating work that is not breaking, trying to break boundaries. We're a little bit falling into the trap, I think, as photographers of of uh, I don't know. There's a there's an aesthetic at the moment where almost like less effort is more effort. You know, mm. people are really falling into this minimalism in yeah, terms yeah. of production. Yeah, minimalism in terms of production and and this kind of um, you know, like using digital photography as analog, you know, like we we shoot digitally and then reproduce it to look old. Mm. Um, and you know, he's, do you think that's bad? I think he's not using the technology properly. I, right. I, you know, I probably hate, a lot of photographers probably hate this, but you know, we photography, photography has always been about technology, right? Mm. That's always been about technology meets art mm. and about sort of the, the progression of that conversation. And sometimes I feel like, you know, we we treasure the old photographers a little too much, um, and we don't always use the, the the technology to the most that it mm. can be. And and you know, I would argue if you were to take a to a camera back and and give it to, you know, like those those photographers of the past, yeah. well, they would use it to the max. They would push it every part of it, mm. um, you know, as part of that exploration to 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 create images. Mm. And I think it's something that, you know, I, I don't see enough of at the moment. A lot of people using Photoshop like they should be and, mm. and you know, being creative with their digital works because, um, you know, if you can do it, you should try it. Right. Yeah. I know that contradicts a little bit what I was saying mm. about going backwards, but I don't yeah. – I think that my ideas of going backwards is not so much a technological conversation as it's more of a Inspiration. ideological yeah. Yeah. conversation. Yeah. 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 Right. It's more about going going back ideologically. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. From a, from a from a from an ideological point of view, rather yeah. than a, a technical an actual one. production of the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being yeah. You know, like canvas you, and yeah. oh man, if you've got a digital camera, you should definitely yeah, totally yeah, use it as yeah. much as you can. Yeah. Um, you know, like why would you take a film camera and take your twenty four shots and then wait two weeks? Interesting and, question. There's something like literally I was thinking yeah. about. I saw uh, two or three days ago. Uh, you know, SC Lauder, the yeah, makeup yeah. company. Yeah. So they recently. Sp- uh, spent like 125 or 130 k to send you know do a photo shoot at the uh, photo shoot at the ISS um, at NASA and I, I didn't see that. Yeah. yeah, so I was looking at that and, and I saw the images and you know they're like really cool photo shoot like I love the whole concept and things like that and then I was thinking you know you could easily reproduce that 
just through Photoshop. Yeah. Literally, you could. Yeah. Um, if you get a good enough editor, good enough. Oh, 100%. Yeah, you could yeah. easily reproduce that, right? For maybe a fraction of that cost. Yeah. And that made me think, like, what's the value now? Because there is that traditional, uh, I think, I think, like, other than feeling the the thought that this is the correct way of actually taking, you know, the, the most, I don't want to say elitist, but the, the most traditional, the most... Uh, What's the word like the most most soulful way of yeah. taking a photograph you know you know like a photo of the of the thing versus actually you know having an end product that looks, looks the same or yeah. looks close to same for a fraction of the cost like what's the argument for not having done through that well, what would be your own opinion well, what on I, that? what I find really funny about that whole thing is like one hundred and twenty thousand for Estee Lauder is not a lot of money no it's not no. so that so I think stuff like that, that's, it's for publicity. That's, mm. So the campaign, it's not about the photo. Right. It's about where the photo was taken yeah. and how it was taken. Right. That, that's, you know, which is, I think is as valid as, 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 as having a quality end product. You know, it's, they're, they're, they're marketing people and they're mm. trying to, you know, create, you know, images or, um, you know, marketing campaigns that are popular. Yeah. So I think for something for me that I look at that and it's a publicity stunt. Right. Um, and it's cool, you know. It's it's, it's from, from, from a stunt perspective or from yeah, a PR yeah. perspective. The in fact that we're talking co- about yeah, it right now. Yeah, but the, in terms of the quality yeah. image, yeah, it's it's just you know it's nothing special. But so I, I guess you know, forgetting SC Lauder, yeah. if there was a an argument, to say that okay, I can reproduce a same shot like in the middle of a dessert, fo- you know, versus photoshopping A to Z that looks exactly the same. Yeah. What's the argument for and against? Do you think for you know taking going that extra mile to take that photo and yeah. you know. I, I think it, it fits a little bit into the same same thing I said. It, it's as an as an artist is is it the is it the story of how you made the image? Mm. Is that as important as the image itself? You know, is is you know, and for some people it is. You know, some people it is. You know, some art buyers will be more interested in the story of the piece than the piece itself, um, and then some will just buy it on an aesthetic point of view. So yeah. I think that that's that's what all that all that is for me is it's it's you know what are you attempting to say as an artist and what's the purpose of it and why, and you know if if you're like I have, I have some some friends um, Ian and Eric in mm-hmm. in Perth are really amazing photographers and um, you know they put a Polaroid camera in an underwater housing right. and put it underwater and took photos and it looks amazing. You could probably easily reproduce those photos mm-hmm. on a digital camera that you could yeah. put in an underwater housing and shoot. But, you know, as, as someone who's looking at the artwork, you know, that, that story about a Polaroid camera being put yeah. in a housing and in a custom made housing. And adds to the final product. Adds to the, adds to the final product, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, yeah. So I think it's just. Right. I think it's a very, very valid answer. Yeah, it, it, it just depends on yeah. on what it is that you're, you're seeking. You're, you're seeking, yeah. Right, very cool. Um, I guess what's your personal goal in the next five years? Uh, short films. I think short mm. films is, is where I'd like to explore. I, I So the reason, one thing I never really touched on is why did I move from photography into video mm. and then into directing? What was the, the purpose of that yeah. move? And for me, it's... It's always been about the, the pursuit of, of quality, and you know when I look at a a Kubrick film yeah. or I look at a especially the um what's his name uh, it's on the top of my mind the Alien director Ridley Scott. Yep. So when I look at a lot of their old stuff. You know, as someone who's into visuals, I see the kind of the height of storytelling. I think is in feature films. Mm. I, re- I really do. I think if you you think about sound. And vision and performance and you know every everything that we do as creatives, you know all the different creatives out there. When you look at a feature film, generally it's all of them coming into the one project, yeah. you know, into a ninety-minute or mm. two-hour mm. project. And so for me, that's the peak of yeah. of creativity. Not the peak of creativity, but in terms of the effort like, involved, like the and, field you're in involved. Yeah, in. yeah, that's, yeah. That's the, the amount of yeah. I think that's the place ultimate. Where you can practice everything. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, that, that's for me is, is always been that, that pursuit of, mm. of that, that ultimate, um, you know, creative goal. And I think mm. that's it for me. And I, yeah. you know, would one day, you know, I'd love to try my hand at a, yeah. at a feature film and really sort of bring all the different things I've been doing, yeah. whether it's stills or DOP and it's directing and kind of 
combine them into, into the one with sound and vision yeah. and performance and, and produce something that, you know, I, 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 that I'd be really, really proud of and that I hope could, you know, also help people in, yeah. in, in their day-to-day lives, whether it's through, you know, just an, an enjoyable film or, yeah. or lessons that can be full, pulled from, from, the, uh, from the work. Because that's another thing that I, I, I think for me, going back like, to that question that I asked you, yeah. what is the meaning of art? And, yeah. and for me, it's that is, you know, if I look at old Greek myths, I look at old Chinese folk tales and I look at, you know, even spiritually things from Buddhism or from, from the Bible, mm. and the stories there is what, and what they're doing is that they're, they're, they're facing, they're telling you stories about the human condition, yeah. about what it means to live, what it means to make decisions, the difference between right and wrong. And what are the consequences of our actions? And I feel like a lot of those stories, that's what they're, they're doing. They're, they're kind of presenting you with the opportunity to learn something without actually doing it. And I feel like, for me, I feel like a little bit of that has been lost in, I think, especially in the sort of the large-scale productions. Is mm-hmm. You don't really see that that learning anymore. You don't sit down and, and walk out of a film going, well, like, I, I, I feel like a different person. Yeah. You go in, you eat some popcorn, you go, well, that CGI is pretty garbage. I guess they satisfied what I was thinking yeah. I was going to see. Peace out. You know, like I, I couldn't, I wouldn't say I, I watched Avengers Endgame and walked out thinking, you know, I'm, you know, I understand, you know, I, the idea of self-sacrifice because, you know, Tony Stark sacrifices his yeah, life yeah. to save everyone. But I wouldn't, I couldn't tell you that that, had any impact on me in terms mm. of the way I go about life day to day. Mm. You know, Tony Stark didn't didn't introduce me to the idea of the benefits of self sacrifice. Mm. Other than I watched a, a, a fantasy character yeah. do something that helped save the universe, mm. that has no bearing on me. It, it doesn't mm, on a personal level. Doesn't yeah. no, it doesn't. And you know, I think we're and again, this goes back to what I was saying about looking backwards, looking into our past mm. to sort of refine our identity. Mm. Um, is looking at those old tales and those old, old stories and thinking, well, why did they tell them and why have they come from thousands of years mm. old, right? Why is the Greek myth still relevant today? But I guess, do you think if Avengers, for in this example, has actually had an impact on other people, do you think I, then that's fair to them oh, tell the stories? 100%. I'm, it's not a slight at... Um, anyone? At any, anyone no, yeah. no, no, no. It's one thing I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't do. You know, I, I, I have no... like. It just it's it, what it's about is about on in a personal me. level. It's, it's yeah, about yeah, me. Like yeah. it doesn't, you know, those things haven't added anything to my life. Right. If no disrespect to anyone yeah, that yeah. that has, you know, mm. maybe they've they've watched Avengers and it's it's helped them become a better person. That's great. Correct. But, but it hasn't. So they, uh, literally, I think that should be the ultimate goal for a creative. Yeah. yeah. You want to make someone's life better. Yeah. You want to you want to help you want to help them understand the world or their, their place in it or, you know, or even keeping the mystery alive in yeah. the world. You know, like. That's something that I, I I really like. You know, I have a a line in my bio that I use, which is um, it says, "Life is more interesting if you believe dragons are hiding in the clouds." Right. And it's that idea of like, you know, let's not take all the mystery out of the world. Yeah. Let's yeah. let's explore the mystery. Let's mm-hmm. add to the mystery. Let's be mm-hmm. excited by the mystery. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're a, you're a kid and you you walk into a forest, it's the, yeah. the most beautiful, magical place you could imagine. You think leprechauns could be hiding around a corner, and isn't life more interesting if you approach mm. it like that rather than, you know, looking for definitive answers for mm. everything that happens around us. Mm. I guess finally, for someone who wants to walk down your path, what are three actionable steps that you can provide? Uh, dive in, feet first. That's number one. Go, go all in. Don't, you know, the, the universe and life has a funny way of, of, of helping those who help themselves. And if you, if you go all in, and and you really give it that effort, and you you struggle, and you know I I, I shot free for three years, mm. you know. The the universe will will find you you will find success, mm. you know, as long as you're committed to the path. Um, that's that's number one. Um, number two is put your work out there, mm. even if it's garbage, mm. you know. But like, <laughs> sorry if any of those are doing garbage, but no, no. But you know, just put it out there, yeah. and and. It might be terrible now, but in ten years it might not be. And and the the attitude and the the the, the opportunities to sort of shave away your insecurities mm-hmm. would be so much more valuable for you down the so path true. than than ferreting and hiding your work forever. Mm-hmm. You know, I think it's it's really important to be to be active in your passion and, yeah. and putting it out there. Um, the third one, 
really really look for something that you're pursuing or you're chasing or you mm-hmm. want to tell because that will help guard you when things are rough. If you have a, an identity or a philosophy or a spirituality, you know, if you're if you're a, you're a Buddhist or you're a Christian, you know, I'm a, I'm a Falun Gong practitioner. That those ideal, those those philosophies and those those ideas will help guide you when things are rough because things will be rough. Yeah, yeah, that's that's just it's how it should be. You know, you have to, I think you have to earn your your creative stripes. Yeah. yeah, that'll make you a better creative. Fantastic, Dan Matsu. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Legend. Hope you hope you had uh, a good conversation. I had a great conversation. Thanks, brother. All right. We'll have to end with the fist bump. Peace, dude. That's an outro. <laughs>